Okay. All right. Um, okay, yeah, so obviously I'm here today. So it, um, from South Australia, Adelaide, um, to talk to you about a project we undertook last year in 2014, um, which was the development and impl implementation of an IV Beacons app at one of our museums, the South Australian Maritime Museum, which is down in Port Adelaide for anyone who knows South Australia. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll look briefly at what we did and why um, and what we learnt through the process. Um, and really, I guess I'm going to use this as a bit of a vehicle to talk about um, digital transformation in our organisation as a whole. Um, okay, so who are we and, and what do we do um, and what can we learn from, from what's been happening in hist at History SA? So, um, here we go. History SA, um, we're a statutory authority. We report to the South Australian Government through the Minister for the Arts. We were established in 1981, so we're not all that old. Um, um, under, and so some of you may know us as the History Trust of South Australia, if you know us at all. Um, um, and sort of our brief or our mandate was, is, well, is to encourage research and public presentation of South Australian history. And we're also... Um, entrusted with um, the South, uh, South Australia's material heritage. Um, so we have a board of trustees and we run three museums, um, three history museums, obviously the South Australian Maritime Museum, uh, the Migration Museum and the National Motor Museum. Um, we're a small to medium sized state funded organisation I guess you could say. Um, and we have just under um, 50 professional staff across all three museums. Um, and then maybe another 20 to 30 casual guide staff across, across the museums. Um, but obviously increasingly, as you'll see through our digital projects and our community engagement projects, we have quite a, a team and quite a lot of projects um, at head office that, that we run as well as at the museums. Um, we also run a community museums program where we register and accredit, accredit community and regional museums throughout the state, and we administer two community museum and history fund grants um, for these museums. Um, and as I said, we're increasingly we're responsible for a number of established and popular community engagement programs and events, uh, including uh, an annual uh, month-long history festival, which has its roots uh, grassroots is a grassroots community history festival an annual state history conference, um, education programs, and various other seminars and ad hoc events. Um, so one of which was uh, recently um, this uh, Violet Versus project. It's a, um, it was a large scale digital, that's what you get when you're using your iPad as your um, text, I've just jumped, sorry. Um, but this was a large scale light show, which was projected. These are our head offices, at, um, it's an old, uh, the Torrance Parade Ground. Uh, we did this with a, Lumi a company called Illuminart and Cindy Drennan, who has done some work, as, oh, sorry, as part of the World War I centenary. She's done some work over in WA as well as elsewhere in the state. Um, so this was all quite fun. Um, so that's us, I suppose. Uh, we're a small to medium history organisation, about 75 staff in total, and we're responsible for the running of the three museums and a series of community engagement and history programs. Okay, so um, I guess where are we right now and, and I guess um, what are we doing and what do iBeacons have to do with this, this digital transformation that we've been undergoing? Um, I guess it started maybe eight years ago where we had an external web consultant that dragged us kicking and screaming through a major website redevelopment project. Um, we're in the space of about three to four years. We went from being an organisation that was severely technologically challenged. I mean, really severely. Um, we had templated Excel timesheets that everyone would, would feel in wrong every week. Um, and so, you know, common story, right? Um, yeah, small organisation, technologically challenged, and finding it hard to let go of its institutional authority. Um, so that was us. So we went from that to, to, to an organisation with a, a, small, a small digital team um, and managing and producing content for a suite of about eight Drupal sites and, and three WordPress sites uh, and many, many social media channels uh, across our four um, locations. Um, so, where are we? Okay, um, 
So it was at this point, I suppose, once we had this new web presence and once we had this, um, um, uh, I guess, this social media presence and we were starting to communicate with our audiences in, in different ways um, and hopefully trying to be a bit more collaborative, um, that we realised we couldn't continue just with a web consultant, that we had to internalise some of this... Um, some of this work and, and um, the management of the sites and our digital strategy and roadmap. So my team was born. Um, there's three of us. Now, I've, I've put this up here just because we're a very, very small team. So we've developed this iBeacons app and we're developing a lot, a lot of other things. Um, so we, we work very, very closely together. So that's Oliver and I um, on the left. Um, at the Museums and the Web conference last week where we bumped into the EMU collections management people, so we took a shot. Um, <laughs> um, so Oliver's our web developer and then um, Catherine Manning, who is our content um, curator um, and sort of is tasked with, uh, I guess, coordinating work across the three museums and across our curatorial staff. Um, yeah. So... When we were formed, it was just me, a manager of digital programs or online programs, um, and we quickly realised that we did need a web... De well, I argued that we needed a web developer and we needed a curator. We needed a, a core team of people with some, some really good skills um, to be the digital lead on projects across all, all three museums. So that's what we've done. Um, and we exist at the expense of others, and our budget exists at the expense of others in the organisation. Um, and obviously now... Rather than our web presence being an organisational-wide sort of community effort and a collective struggle against our um, web consultant, um, we now have this have this manager at head office, who managed to convince our chief executive that we needed these other resources. Um, so um, w our birth was a difficult one, I suppose, um, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but. Oh, sorry, I should have just printed this out. Um, but so we're small, but we're, and we're trying to do a lot. Um, but I think our size works in our favour, and I think the iBeacons um, project is sort of a, a good example of this, because um, we were able to be on the on the ground with our creative staff, and you know because we're very small and we've got a small budget, um, we're agile and we try and be iterative in our approach, um, and you know increasingly we're trying to be audience focused. Um, so. This is what I guess this is what we're trying to do, and so the iBeacons project was the first project that we where we tried to work in this way, um, and it's, I, I guess we look at it as phase two of our of our um, digital transformation. So, um, right. So um, yeah, we're trying to be collaborative. So, so my small team is trying to be collaborative across our three museums. We're trying to be agile and iterative. Um, in our development processes and, or, like I said, audience-focused and, and, and raise the digital literacy of our staff, you know, you know all very common things these days. Um, so we developed an iBeacons app, I guess the, the iBeacon technology became available early last year and, and we seized on it for a number of reasons. Um, so we decided to scope a small project that could be completely produced in-house. So um, our web developer, Oliver, um, wrote a native iOS app that, sorry, um, a native iOS app, um, so entirely in-house um, and paired with Estimate Beacons. Um, I'll, I'll talk through the detail of the app in a minute if you can't read that. Um, and so basically it, it's nothing fancy. I'm not saying that we did anything really, really wonderful. It's more about the process for us, I guess, in, in, and what we've learnt from it. Um, but it delivers content to, to people's phones based on their location in the gallery. Um, it's a treasure hunt experience. Um, uh, and, we, and, so, and, and I know treasure hunts aren't, you know, that then, that I'm not saying that they're very, you know, that they're a great way for people to engage with objects in our galleries, um, as we found. It was just kids running around, um, you know, not not doing anything terribly meaningful. So, so, we, but we'll get, 
yeah, I, I guess I'm just trying to be really honest about what we learnt from this process. We just jumped in feet first thinking, wow, there's this great new technology um, and we were able to get our hands on it and we played and so we've learnt a lot from it. Um, but we, we chose to develop for iOS because we were developing in-house and we wanted to keep things simple. And we, again, we chose the treasure hunt sort of gamification experience um, because the Estimote community, so the beacons, um, they already offered a basic template, essentially, that we could take and modify and adapt. So it was very quick to develop um, for our web developer. Um, we, obviously, we didn't want to spend 12 months and thousands of dollars scoping and prototyping and developing um, an app that may not work very well at all, um, or that may be outdated by the time we deployed it in the gallery. Um, so obviously, this is not new. Um, this idea of iterative development and rapid deployment, um, it's, it's not new, it's being done everywhere. Um, but we also, the other thing we did was we looked at our existing digital audiences and our, and our analytics told us that across all of our museums, our programs, our digital products, 80% of our mobile users were iOS. So it was really a no-brainer for us. Um, we, we, we dedicated our resources to developing for iOS only in this instance. You know, if it had been really successful, then we would have rolled it out to Android as well. Uh, but we're not. That might tell you something. <laughs> um, okay, so, and so the app was developed to accompany a major exhibition at the South Australian Maritime Museum. And it was developed primarily, it was a collaboration between our web developer and the curator who developed the exhibition at the Maritime Museum, um, which opened last year. It placed, so I'll just run you through basically what it did. It basically placed a museum visitor on board a 19th century immigrant sailing ship from Britain to Australia, uh, which it, you know, obviously this, uh, this 19th century was a, a large period of mass migration. Um, and the exhibition, it, uh, the exhibition itself explored the changing role of the surgeon aboard uh, from the 18th century's sort of poorly trained barber surgeons um, to the more qualified practitioners of the mid 19th century. So the exhibition examines the ways in which surgeons tried to alleviate pain under extreme conditions without access to antiseptics or um, anaesthetics. So we had a bit of fun with the app, with um, the gruesome nature of, of people's ailments and the sound effects that may go with it. And so it was, it was fun and it was immersive. Um, just we're not convinced that um, the kids learnt very much. Um, so... In the app, as I said, the visitor takes on a persona of a ship surgeon, um, and I'm not sure if I took a screenshot that's probably cut some stuff off. Sorry, but um, you're presented basically after you go through your intro screens. You're presented with a list of, of sick passengers, um, and okay. So some of the, the things that we learned was don't let the exhibition designers dictate the fonts that are used in a digital product because it's very very hard to read. Um, and um, kids in particular had a lot of trouble reading this text. Um, so they opted for the audio option every time. So there was an option to, to hear these, these words being spoken. Um, they opted for that every time. Okay. Um, okay, so you choose your patient and you can read about them. So if we're going to... So this is, say, you've chosen... Um, to read about a particular patient, so you get their symptoms, um, and um, then you've basically you um, yeah you move around the exhibition space searching for the correct cure. So th these are all objects within the exhibition space. In the cases, um, um, this is sorry, this is just a shot on the iPad. Um, this is again one of the one of the patients. Um, so you move around until your phone finds a beacon signal um, and then what it will do is it will tell you what you found. So, you know, pretty simple, nothing pretty about the notifications, but it tells you, okay, you found lemons, would you like to use this remedy? Um, and you can say yes or no. And so you go around and you, you treat all six patients in this manner and at the end you basically, you get a certificate that, that gives you, that, that, that um, says you're a qualified ship surgeon or that you basically flunked out and you, you shouldn't be responsible for looking after people. And these are just some of the sorts of um, objects and um, cures that you might be looking for. Um, 
up in the top, I think. So again, like I said, we had lots of fun because of the gruesome nature of it. Uh, but, you know, bone syringes and, and saws and, and even um, wriggling leeches were some of the cures. So the app was primarily designed to encourage the museum visitors to interact with their physical space, uh, as for the physical environment and the objects and stories in the exhibition. Um, and like I said, we had some gruesome pictures and sound effects. Um, and obviously being a small team with a very small budget, I mean, we basically had no budget for this at all. I think um, in the end, I think it was maybe it cost two or three hundred dollars um, on top of staff time. Um, so, you know, not a lot. We we're just very lucky to have the, the expertise in-house. Um, so we, we weren't trying to be too ambitious. Um, so it was a simplistic treasure hunt style game. We, and, and we used a lot of free images and audio tracks to flesh out the experience. And the exhibition curator, Lyndall Lawton, from the South Australian Maritime Museum, wrote all the app text and sourced most of the images for us. And I was our web developer, Oliver, designed and built the app um, using, so Estimote provides a SDK, a software development kit and some other um, support. So it was very, well, it's relatively easy for him to, to produce the app for us. Um, he also sourced and configured the beacons and he submitted the app through the app store and just went through the process. Um, so how did it work? We, so obviously I said gameplay is based on location, proximity and the beacons. And there were six beacons installed throughout the exhibition to, to match the six patients um, aboard the ship. Um, and they were hidden behind and underneath and on top of showcases, uh, which proved to be a very fiddly process. Um, our curator didn't want the beacons visible because it upset the exhibition aesthetics. Um, so it was very hard to place them where they were still, like, like where you could get good range with people's phones. Um, it was fiddly, um, so you, you do need to allow a bit of time for that. Um, or, you know, buy different beacons, perhaps. Uh, uh, no, I wouldn't say that, actually. Estimate beacons were quite good. Um, but um, I think a very good example of what not to do would be that our, our web developer left the curator to choose all of the storylines and objects for the app. So he did, and you know I, I was away at the time, so unfortunately I wasn't there to sort of manage it. But um, not once did anyone check on the location of these objects in the exhibition space. They didn't liaise with the curator, the designer. So what we found was that four of the six beacons were clustered in two showcases back to back. Like, so in terms of a user experience, it was terrible, um, really, if I'm being honest. Um, so the, the, the beacon ranges needed to be set very, very low so that you, your phone only discovered the content as you're standing right in front of that particular showcase. Um, otherwise, you're getting you know, unrelated stuff. Um, so you know, that, that didn't work so well. Um, the collaboration sort of fell down there, I guess. Um, so they, you know, um, yeah. There are many, uh, many ways in which it has worked very well, though. Um, in the area of the content production, I guess, um, the, the curator, so our curator and our um, web developer collaborated across our internal intranet. So that's where the project was managed. That's where they uploaded all of their text, images, um, you know, screenshots of the app as it was in development, all of that. And so all of the communication and the management um, of the project was done through the intranet. Um, and so these are some of the examples of where we got our audio. So they managed all of this through the internet too. They sourced things, they shared, and they, they commented on, on what worked and what didn't. Um, okay, I'll just quickly skip ahead. So, so that worked well. So I guess um, for this project, what, what that the collaboration between our team, which was very new and sat at head office and was... I guess um, we're in a bit, bit of a precarious position. That the collaboration with the curator on the ground, who was responsible for the content, who knew the content, who knew who to talk to to source particular stuff, um, that collaboration worked very, very well. Um, 
And then uh, I guess another collab. So uh, I guess if we're looking at this in terms of establishing relationships with our our staff and 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 getting them working well with us, um, our education officer, we only, we managed to get a lot of buy-in from her too. Um, we spent some time developing a workshop um, of the app, and with the education officer, and then we we trialled it for a day with school kids and with the education officer in the space. Um, that's where we got most of our that's most of our feedback actually was watching the kids and talking to the kids use it and and that's really what told us that um, it needed some work I guess that um, that user experience what hadn't been thought out so well we'd we'd applied this gamification model which is all well and good um, but what we hadn't really done was thought through the steps of how someone might um, might behave in the exhibition space um, let's get We'll go back to that pretty one. Um, but so I guess what was important is that it really opened up this dialogue with, with staff that we didn't have very good, uh, not, very, not that we had bad relationships with, but that we didn't have established working relationships with. Um, so, so that was a real positive. But what did we learn? We learned a lot about where to place the beacons in the exhibition space, obviously. We learned that there's a vast difference in um, how seemingly similar mobile devices pick up beacon strengths. So, you know, your iPads and your iPad minis um, were pretty good. I mean, an iPhone 6 was pretty good, but you wouldn't even think of going anywhere near the beacons with an iPhone, iPhone 4, for instance. And many of our volunteers still have iPhone 4s. Um, so they would go down to the museum and experience it and they couldn't pick up the signal. Um, so it varies significantly um, device from device. So this whole notion of bring your own device um, didn't work for us. You know, we, we needed to be able to control what kinds of devices people were accessing the content on. Um, so obviously um, for our next project we're supplying iPad minis so that we know what version, uh, so what what device, what version, what iOS um, they've got, all of those things, just to make sure that um, we know the content will be delivered to their phone. Um, we learnt that exhibition designers aren't always comfortable, well, at least the, the exhibition designers we work with are not comfortable in the digital space um, and ha they've had trouble delivering digital files of the types we need. Um, so the designers and curators needed to be flexible when it came to supplying the imagery and the fonts and the colours and the branding. Um, so what that's meant for us is that we've refined our processes and now we have a standard package that we ask or we request of designers for any project we're involved with. So um, it's helped us refine our processes and, and, and helped us to know what to ask for um, ahead of time. Uh, and we learnt that most people don't want to download an app once they get to our museum. Um, um, you know, so that, uh, we, I mean, the app was downloaded, I think, 250 times, which really isn't a lot over a three-month period. Um, and the, the, the feedback we got was that once they're down there, we, I mean, we get a lot of tourists um, who might, you know, we don't provide free Wi-Fi, so we get a lot of tourists who don't, you know, they can't download, um, you know, as well as many other reasons, but, but basically people didn't want to download the app once they were there. Um, and we learnt that the front of house staff can make or break a digital product in the museum. Um, I mean, in terms of stakeholder engagement, we needed to invest time training our front of house staff in how to use and troubleshoot that product. Um, that was really key and it's a, an area that we really fell down in, I, I think. Um, and I think you'll get far more buy-in and support um, if you involve them in that process early on. So obviously we're doing all of these things now with new projects. Um, at the time, we learnt the hard way. Um, so, and finally we learnt that, so there were other internal departments who were stakeholders that we, we really didn't consider, uh, like our marketing department, um, who we needed to champion the product and we needed them to promote it. Um, but because we hadn't involved them earlier on, they found it very, very hard to conceptualise uh, why the app was important. Um, so it obviously didn't um, make it to their list of priorities. So again, it wasn't marketed, it wasn't, you know, it took um, almost two months to get signage in the museum um, with details of the app. So there were a number of things that, that didn't work well. But what it did do was, that in terms of the process, it really helped us um, establish a model for collaboration and communication across our three, three museums. So now we have a very 
definite defined way of working across the museums based on these projects. Um, and that's, that's also helped us establish really good working relationships. Um, and obviously we've refined our own project management processes um, and built in things like the digital design specs into to projects and, and for social media and, and the like. Um, and I guess really what, what it did do, um, again, was to sort of gain the trust of the curators. It helped, it helped demonstrate that this, this idea of rapid development in iterations, that we can push something out and then we can change it and we can keep developing it. Oh, okay. Um, and that, that, that one, two, two words, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, um, that they had a lot more trust in us that it, and in that process. So I guess really it was positive, um, but, you know, the, the, and we, we used the technology to sort of help bring our, uh, raise that digital literacy and help, you know, um, refine our processes around embedding digital in the museum. Um, and it was just, it was a fun project. Um, but yes, if you've got any questions about the technical aspects or, or anything else with, you know, We've learnt a lot. Thanks. Christy, thanks so much for that. I'm really honest. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> honest talk. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of you who'd like to ask questions. We have perhaps time for two or three questions if they're quick. And um, Christy, if you could repeat the question into the mic. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so the question was, what would my top three tips be for bringing curators on board who may be fearful of technology? Um, yeah, it's a difficult one. I was talking to some people in the morning tea break about this. Um, it's, um, I guess that that buy-in early on uh, is really important. Like um, the the sense, uh, giving them a sense that um, that the project and the ideas are partly formed through their involvement rather than just saying, yeah, here you go, we're building this, you need to help us. So I think that was probably the key thing. That and just being on the ground with them, um, being there sometimes, holding their hands, sitting by the computer with them, um, showing them how to use the intranet or whatever it may be. Was probably They're probably the two key things. Um, but yeah, I don't think we've really mastered it yet. We're getting there. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so, oh, sorry, yeah, I'll repeat. So the question was, um, I did suggest that it wasn't a very good educational tool um, and that the, the kids didn't engage so well or learn. Um, the, the only way, yeah, the only way we really tested that was through working with our education officer based down there. So she devised like a, a program throughout the day and we worked with, I think, three school groups. So, that, so a small sample. Um, but um, so, and that was then through observation and then feedback with the students afterwards. Um, so she's got a bit of a detailed report, and I can, you know, I can flick that onto you. But but basically, um, the the end sort of uh, the conclusion was that um, there was no clear pathway. The the you know there was no um, <laughs> visual, um, I guess, visual indication of where the students may go, and so they were a bit lost. And then all of a sudden they found, found this cluster of content around these, these beacons and, you know, they would just tap and try things and, and rush through and then that was it. Um, that, you know, that there was some really, that the content was fantastic. It's just I think our implementation um, could be refined. Thank you very much.